I propose we use the remaining 20 minutes in one of two ways, and I propose we have a vote to decide which of the two ways. Uh, way number one is I have uh, a result that we're going to present at the UAI conference in the summer that I'm excited about. It's actually a theoretical result that bears on now. And we could use 15 of those 20 minutes presenting that and then five minutes to uh, just kind of have general discussion. That's, if you vote for plan A, that's plan A. Plan B is we just skip that and we open up to discussion because I think there were a lot of people with ideas during the break. That's plan B, is just open discussion. Okay? Who wants plan A? I'm, I'm good with either. Oh no, this is going to turn out like an even vote. Okay, uh, 72. How many people want plan B? <laughs> How many people want plan B? Okay, 12. Okay, looks like plan A. Okay, um, so we'll leave some time for discussion. All right, so let me... Um, Here is really one of the very fundamental questions that you have no choice but to think about if you want to build a never-ending learning system, or even a learning system that only learns for 100 years like you. Um, what's the difference be between correctness and consistency? So, you know, if you have some agent that's, let's say an autonomous agent that can sense the world, in, this, in some way Nell senses the web, a robot would sense the world, you and I sense the world with our sensors. And if that agent can learn both how to perceive and how to predict, then there's a sense in which that agent can't really ever know whether it's predicting correctly and perceiving correctly, or just making nonsense predictions and perceiving incorrectly, right? Like, I think my visual system is correct, and so I predict that if I move my hand to the right, I'm going to bump into the table, and I feel like I do. Uh, so I, I think I, I'm right. But actually, all I can really guarantee is that I'm consistent. It could be that my sense of touch is uh, misperceiving a bump uh, because some part of my brain was expecting it anyway. And I'm not really bumping into anything, right? So you see what I mean? There's a sense in which any agent that's learning to perceive and learning to predict can't really be sure whether it's hallucinating in its perception and just mispredicting and being, in, and being consistent versus being consistent and also being correct, that there really was a table there. For now, we have this problem too. And if you think about good idea number one in Nell, the one that said we should train functions to be consistent, then you have to worry about this, right? Nell could train a whole bunch of functions to be consistent. In fact, somebody asked that question as soon as I brought up the idea. Couldn't they just all be consistent by saying yes all the time? They could. Um, so there's this kind of fundamental question, but agents can measure how internally consistent they are, but in some real sense, they can't really measure how correct. And so a very interesting theoretical question is, what is really the relationship between consistency and correctness? Um, and are there conditions under which consist being increasingly consistent, which is what Nell is trying to do, is trying to be increasingly consistent. Are there conditions under which that can guarantee that you're also going to become increasingly correct? There's a related phrasing of the question, which is, is there any way that an autonomous agent can determine on its own how correct it really is, its own accuracy? <coughs> and um, over the past months, 
working with Avram Blum and other faculty here and Anthony Plantanios, one of our first year PhD students, we've come up with um, a step in this direction that I want to share with you. Um, and it's really a method that we're now building into Nell for Nell to estimate its own correctness, its own accuracy, not just its consistency. And the, the key idea in one sentence is um, under some assumptions, uh, you can show that consistency implies correctness. And when we try out that approach on Nell, it actually works remarkably well. So let me tell you how we frame the problem. Here's the way we frame the problem. So formally, suppose you have n different f estimates of the same function. So this would be like the function that's trying to tell whether a noun phrase refers to a person or not. We'll call those f1 through fn. In general, these are just different approximations to the same target function f. And this is some Boolean function that maps from x to 1 and 0. Okay, so for example, the target could be to take a noun phrase x and say yes or no, does it refer to a person? And these different functions could be the different red and blue and green functions in Nell, for example. So these are just different functions trying to estimate the same thing. Okay, now I'm also going to define the agreement rate between two functions as just the probability that if we take a randomly, a randomly drawn x, a randomly drawn noun phrase, that function i and j will give us the same answer. They'll both say yes or they'll both say no. That's the agreement rate. So the key insight is that these agreement rates and these errors are related in the following way. The probability that a function i and function j will agree given a randomly drawn noun phrase is just the probability that neither of them is wrong plus the probability that they're both wrong. That's the two ways they can agree. And if you work out the arithmetic, it turns out there's this nice relation that the rate at which they'll agree, that is this quantity up here, the probability that they agree on an unlabeled example, which we can measure. We just give these functions a thousand unlabeled examples and see that they agree 827 times out of a thousand. So we can measure this from unlabeled data. That probability that they'll agree is just one minus the probability that function one makes an error minus the probability function two makes an error plus the probability that they jointly make an error. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. There's this equation that relates agreement, which is like consistency, to error, which is like correctness. And so that's kind of interesting. But more interesting, that, so there are two key results, two results that we found. One is that equation alone doesn't help you too much, but if you have three functions instead of two, and those three functions make independent errors, so that's an assumption you're gonna, that we're making here. If they make independent errors, and their accuracies are better than chance, okay, so we have to make those two assumptions. Then we can rewrite that expression and rewrite the probability that they both make an error is just if they're independent errors, then we can rewrite that as the probability that the first one makes an error times the probability that the second makes an error. If they're independent, that's a reasonable rewrite. And now we have an equation which has AIJ is observed. We know that we can measure that from unlabeled data. And we have only two unknowns, the error rate for function one and, or for function I and for function J. But the cool thing is if we have three functions, and Nell of course does, then we can look at the agreement rates between all three ways. We end up with three of these equations 
one of them for a sub 1, 3, one for a sub 2, 3, one for a sub 1, 2. We have three equations with only three unknowns. Error rate of function 1, error rate of function 2, error rate of function 3. And we can solve, given the agreement rates for the error rates. So that's kind of interesting. And that's, but that's only, that's only true if we make this assumption that the errors are independent and that the accuracies are above 0.5, better than chance. Okay. The second result, which I'm more excited about, is that even if we don't know whether the errors that they're making are independent, but we think they're, they may be dependent, then we can put a prior, if we are willing to put a prior on how dependent they are, for example, we're, we're willing to assume that it's more likely that they're more independent than that they're highly dependent errors. Then we can turn this into a constrained optimization problem where we have those same three equations but now we have more unknowns, including these joint error dependencies. And we have to estimate the individual error rates plus what's the probability that function one and three jointly make an error plus what's the probability that two and three jointly make an error. We can set that up as a constrained optimization problem where the constraints are these equations for each pair of functions. And the optimization, we, the, the problem we try to solve is Give me a solution to EI, EJ, and the joint EIJs such that all these constraints are satisfied, plus among the many possible solutions that would satisfy those, pick the one that minimizes the difference between the independent error assumption and um, the actual estimate that we have for the joint. So when you do that and run it on Nell's data, it actually works remarkably well. Here is for the category body part, that's like hand, arm, elbow. Um, here are four different classifier readers in Nell. And the red is the true error of those classifiers judged by us humans. And the blue is the estimate that Nell gets using this um, agreement rate method when uh, considering only unlabeled data. So the blue bars are basically Nell's estimates using unlabeled data only of the accuracy of these competing classifiers for body part. And similarly for beverage, for bird, for person. So, well, and, and here it is for a different data set, which I'm going to talk about next week, next Wednesday. Uh, we'll talk about some work we're doing, machine learning applied to brain imaging. Um, we tried it on the, that data set, too, with pretty good results. The, the, the null results are so good that the mean difference between the unlabeled data estimate of the error and the actual error judged by humans is less than 1%. Very accurate. So, so that's the idea. And to tie it back to what does this have to do with consistency and correctness, here's a method that is using the observed consistency between functions to estimate the actual correctness of those functions. And it turns out you cannot we can't find a way, and I think there is not a way, to do it without making some assumptions. But here is a useful set of assumptions embedded in this algorithm. And the assumptions are precisely this. We assume that each of these functions is better than chance. Its accuracy is better than 0.5. And we assume that among the many solutions to the constraints that we give, that is the many different assignments of errors um, and joint errors, joint probability of errors, 
we um, have a prior, we have a constrained optimization that selects the assignment of errors and joint errors where the, the difference between the joint error and the joint error predicted by assuming independence is minimized. And I think in the case of Nell, that's a reasonable thing because, right, one of these things is using the character string and a different function is using the words around the noun phrase, different ones using the HTML code. They're kind of independent, not exactly independent, and because they're training each other, they become dependent. Um, the errors are not independent, but the fact that the uh, inputs to the functions are different features makes it, I think, a reasonable prior that it's more likely that we get independent errors than not. And so at least in the case of Nell, where these different competing functions that are being learned are using different percepts, if you will, different features to make their classification, then the idea, then the prior that says it's more likely that the dependencies, the error dependencies are small, is a reasonable prior. And in fact, it does lead to very good estimates. Now I want to end just by pointing out that you and I have percepts that we use when we're learning. Um, if I have to recognize the person, I can look you in the face visually. I can listen to your voice. Um, there are some people for whom I can smell and tell who it is including my wife. Uh, I mean that only in the kindest way. Um, and just like Nell's character strings and context, these are three different functions that my brain is learning that are based on rather independent sensor data. And so I don't know that that's why people do such a good job of learning from primarily unlabeled data. But I think it's an interesting fact that just like Nell's multiple functions based on different views of a noun phrase, we have these different sensors that again, we use to train classifiers from. And those different sensors have the same kind of character that they kind of make independent errors in the sensors. If I mishear your voice, I'm, that seems kind of uncorrelated with mistaking uh, getting a photon wrong on my retina. So um, I think that's an interesting place, uh, interesting thing to think about. So I just wanted to drop this idea on you. Kind of excited about it because it's one of the few fundamental theoretical things that uh, we've been able to look at and actually make use of. So Anthony is now incorporating into Nell this method with the idea that this will now allow Nell to look for itself, estimate how well each of those two or 3,000 functions is doing that it's learning, and then uh, apply some self-reflection to decide where it should spend more learning effort and where it c can maybe stop learning or not spend so much time. Right now, Nell is doing kind of uniform allocation, trying to learn everything all at once. But to the degree that it can use this to do some self-reflection and see how to spend its time wisely, then it might open up some new possibilities. OK, so thank you. You've been very patient. Uh, if you want to have a few minutes of questions, I'm happy to do that. I need to be at a different meeting at 11 o'clock, so it'll be a short question period. Questions? Yes. Sorry? Where did we make use of the random assumption? Better than chance. Oh, if you don't use the better than random assumption, there are two solutions. Um, so uh, if you say it's better than chance, you, let's say you get a solution that um, the error rate is 4%. If you don't use that assumption, then there's another solution where it's 1 minus that. And so uh, 
That's, where that, that's why you need that assumption. And it gets worse when you have, um, when you have a lot of functions. So you're, you're estimating a lot of joint pro probabilities of joint errors. And so then all these reflections multiply and, and it gets worse than just having two solutions. But that's, that's where that comes in. Yes? So, um, uh, this is a system uh, for reading information. Have you tried uh, reversing the flow of information? So, instead of reading phrases, you deal with small phrases and you can search for information instead of just browsing and uh, uh, looking for it? So, so, when you say could search for information, like, what? For example, like, uh, is it a noun uh, or, a, or a word? You want to look for more information about a word to, to complement the things you have. So uh, instead of just crawling and waiting for it to, to, uh, to happen, I guess. Uh -huh. Oh, right. Yes, yes, I see what you mean, right. Go out and look for text. You're trying to learn about Carnegie Mellon University. Go out and find text that mentions it. Right, right. So that, yeah, that's, um, so if I understand, you're, you're getting at the idea that instead of just using some uniform distribution of web pages, why don't you do a search query and get some relevant text to read. So um, one of the components that showed up on my current architecture of NEL, uh, but I didn't discuss, is a component called OpenEval, which does that. Um, it goes out and uh, it does search queries specifically for targeted text so that it can read about a specific thing. And that's the work of Mehdi Samadi, who is one of our PhD students, who hopefully will graduate this summer. Um, but uh, his, his PhD thesis project is now incorporated and does that sort of thing. And I think I mentioned earlier that Google has kindly given us an API that allows Nell to make 100,000 queries a day to the search engine, so we get to use it for that sort of thing. Yeah, our n-gram model is used. Uh, we use a lot of different um, distributional semantic vectors. Um, um, not n-gram models in particular. But for example, this, we have two new classifiers. One that just uses, um, we have a dependency parse of 500 million web pages, uh, which means every sentence we know, what's the verb, what's the subject, what's the object. And so for example, uh, this classifier takes every noun phrase and represent it by the vector of verbs for which it is the subject and how frequently and verbs for which it is the object and how frequently. So it's not the same as the n-gram model, but those types of corpus statistics are widely used in different ways. Yes? So uh, if you try to minimize the difference between the EIG and the EIMPJ, it seems that just the EIG is equal to EIMPJ in the solution. It would, but it doesn't because then you won't satisfy the agreement rates. So you have to satisfy all of the, you have a system of equations which look like this. And for every pair of functions, you have the agreement rate that you observe on unlabeled data. And then you have the unknowns, EI, EJ, and EIJ. And we have a system of those equations. And now we must solve for these three unknowns, EI, EJ, EIJ, and actually more than three. We'll have, if we have more than three, for every function, we'll have an, an E, and then we'll have all the combinations of EIJs. So we can't set, unless the functions truly are independent, if they truly are independent, this will find it. And it will set EIJ equal to EI times EJ. But if they're not independent, that information will be reflected in the observed agreement rates. And so it's a constrained optimization problem. The hard constraints are those equations for every I and J.
And the soft part, the optimization, is this. And so we, we make this as small as possible, subject to the constraints that the agreement rates must be set, equations must be fully satisfied. So uh, in terms of Bayesian method, that turns out to putting some kind of prior, like a Gaussian prior on uh, the difference between the actual joint errors and their independent it's like putting a Gaussian prior on how independent they are. And then this, solving this constrained optimization is then like getting a posterior estimate of um, those under that prior assumption. But it's the agreement rate equations that prevent it from being zero, unless in fact empirically they are independent, in which case it does set them to zero. So in that sense, this is a strict generalization of the original, of the first result, where we assume they were independent. OK, last question, then I've got to run. Uh, what kind of hardware uh, you were running on, and how expensive the manipulation? Yeah, good question. Um, the hardware that Nell runs on is of two kinds. We have a Hadoop cluster that uh, Garth Gibson, one of our faculty here, is uh, developing and using for research purposes. It has I don't know, roughly 100 machines with, I don't know how many cores, but we're using that. And we have roughly a billion web pages distributed on there and get uh, corpus statistics from there. Um, but we found for many of the learning algorithms, now that we understand what the algorithms are, like the one that learns uh, the contexts that indicate how you should, you know, the mayor of X is a context that indicates it's a city. Those learning algorithms, the sufficient statistics that they need from that data um, are basically a matrix for every noun phrase in the data and every context where the ijth entry is how often does this noun phrase Pittsburgh occur with this context mayor of. And so we cashed out, we used to do to build these huge matrices sparse matrices of noun phrases versus context with tens of millions of rows and tens of millions of columns, but they're sparse, many zeros. And then uh, we just port those over to a really big server, and much of Nell just runs on that really big server. Nell could run a lot faster, and I don't let it run faster because I'm afraid I won't be able to keep up with what it's doing. So right now, th this is the honest truth. Right now, we know how to make it run faster. We could buy more hardware and parallelize it. It's not hard. But, um, but since it's a research project and we want to keep an eye on it and also not let it go crazy, uh, uh, we're running it sort of only at the speed that we can track it. Okay, so thanks again. Uh, I, I'm really glad you all came all the way to Pittsburgh for the summer school. Um, I've talked to some of the other speakers. I know there's a lot of cool stuff coming up. Please come back next Wednesday morning and we'll talk about machine learning and how it can be used to study how the human brain does language processing because that's the other 50% of my own machine learning research and I'd love to share it with you. So we'll see. You.